Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the textile FITM lecture. Um, where is everybody joining from tonight? I can't. Here we go. Oh, wow, Colorado, Florida, Seattle, Seattle, Austin. Oh, I love Austin. Oh my gosh, we're all over. So people are staying up a little late. Great. Oh my, LA, we got lots of people that are local too. I hope they're fit on people. Um, so that's pretty neat. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Kate Gabrielli and I graduated from FITM in the knitwear department. And I currently own a textile design studio. Um, all of FITM's education and the people that I met were, you know, beneficial into me creating my own um, textile design studio. So we sell to all major retailers and it's a really great um, business. So, I'm also lucky tonight to be joined by Sophia, who is a textile knitwear and graphic designer. Um, her goal is to create patterns that um, revolutionize textiles in the fashion industry. Her designs are culturally driven and inspired by her Japanese and Mexican heritage. Sophia graduated with a bachelor's degree and her AA in textile design. So Sophia, welcome. Hi, <laughs> hi. And I'm also, I have Sasha and Sasha is a mixed media artist and emphasizing on signage and paintings and textiles, which is really neat. Um, she studied textile design at FITM and fine arts at Cal, Cal State, Cal Arts. Um, so she also did surface treatments in Parson Paris who doesn't love Paris. Um, and she does decades of signage, murals, paintings, and joined the creative team at Peace Fits Oakland based clothing company in 2013. So Sasha, come on board. Hi. <laughs> so I wanna thank you both for allowing me to host tonight and start off with some background and I'd love to hear how you guys both kind of stumbled into FITM and what made you guys choose textile design. So Sophia, you wanna start? Sure. Um, hi guys, my name's Sophia. Um, I started at FITM um, after, right after I graduated high school, literally two weeks after I graduated high school. Um, I kind of got into FITM. Um, I, well, I went into the early program for junior acceptance for a scholarship but when I was looking into schools, I actually started a lot younger. Um, I went into trying all types of different schools because I knew I was always super artistic and kind of wanted to go that direction career wise. Um, and then as early as middle school, I went and on tours and I went to fit them and I knew that this was the school I wanted to go to. <laughs> um, and then from then on through high school, I started going to different meetings. I did a lot of workshops. Um, I also went to the debut fashion show that they had every year. Um, and that kind of inspired me to come to school here. Um, so and you're doing debut this year, right? I am. I am. This is actually going to be my second time. Get, go, thank you. <laughs> this is actually going to be my second time going to be able to do um, debut this year. So oh, that's, that's really exciting. cool. Yeah. That's really um, cool. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like how you said, I went into FITM um, doing my AA in textile design, and then I went into my BA in design, um, and I finished that last summer, and now I'm in the debut program and in the AA advanced fashion design program. That is pretty great. Sasha, <laughs> how about you? What brought you to FITM and the textile design area? Um, what brought me to FITM is wanting to kind of use the skills that I have uh, based in painting and in signage, lettering, um, my love for textiles and fabric and uh, like surface treatments and finding a way to have that give me more like computer skills, more design and um, being able to use that in like in the works, in the workforce. 
That's interesting. Now, before, like when you did signage and things like that, was it all hand done? Like a majority of your background is all like hands on. A hundred percent. So the last 10 years I've been, no, actually 12 years I've been doing signage. That's all analog and it's everything's completely drawn by hand, painted by hand. Um, little, almost no rulers, very little measuring. Um, so computers were, I just never really use computers that much. Um, Have you find that super helpful now going in and, you know, the FINA program is very based on computers because that's what the industry kind of demands. So do you really like find it helpful, like being able to actually draw and then like transport it into computer? Yes. Yeah. There's a lot that you can't do. Um, <laughs> there's a lot that you can't do by hand and there's a lot that you can only do on a computer. So I can do a really elaborate painting and create, change the colors effortlessly in Photoshop. And that would take hours to redo no colorways or to right. things like that. Yeah. And control alt delete is yeah. everybody's best friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> way control alt delete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you guys, when you're in school, like how do you get your inspiration? Like in your classes, are you going ahead and like, do you get a theme or do you guys like dive in with your notebooks and kind of explore things that way? Anybody? Um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> Sorry. Um, in the program, when you first start out in the textile design um, major, what they have you do um, when you initially start is kind of give you prompts to kind of get the idea of how to create um, ideas and create concepts and motifs from there. Um, and then later on throughout the program, as you make more and more collections, it's more of a self-driven uh, inspiration. Um, and then you basically um, look towards things around you. They have us go out into the our city that we live in or in basically anywhere that we find super interesting and kind of target it toward the market that we're tailoring it towards. And then that's from there, that's how we kind of figure out where we're going for inspiration. Neat. And so Sasha, you must dive into your paintings or revisit techniques and things of that nature. Yeah, so the sketchbook is really important because it helps you really kind of explore with concepts. It helps you create completely authentic and unique work that is 100% your own and you don't have to worry about um, using somebody else's work or referencing something. It makes it so that it is authentically and truly yours. And really, um, that's so important. <laughs> very important. Um, but trying to, learning ways to, everyone can have a picture of a leaf, but finding your own way to, um, kind of manipulate it, change it, and having different reference, either pictures you take or um, a picture that you find that you change the colors and you create a new style, finding ways to just explore with that and having it be truly yours. For sure. I have, um, in my studio, I have about 15 artists that work for me globally. And I send out the same trend board to all of them. I'll do the same color pitch, the same images, the same everything. And it's always so amazing to see what each artist comes back with and like how they viewed it. So I know that it's really interesting and when you're looking at other people's and how you do that. So what do you guys find when you're building a collection? What are like the most important components? Um, when building a collection, you kind of have to look at all concepts that you're going for. It's more of like a technical question where you're trying to find a balance between companions and making bigger motifs, depending on what market you're going for. So you kind of take all the factors from your research that Sasha was saying, finding to make sure it's truly yours, and then kind of targeting that. Um, and to build a collection from there. You want to have like a big variety from there. So that's kind of how you build from what you're inspired to. So making the artwork and then from to make the textiles. Interesting. Do you guys both pick like, uh, you keep referencing like uh, the world that you kind of want to design in. Like, do you pick women's wear, children's, like 
do you pick that and kind of like find your style within that? Yeah, so um, I usually like to design in my market, which is between like 25 and 40. I'm a little older, um, so my market's going to be a little older than most some of the people at FITM. Um, but then I can actually do kids wear. I can do um, I can do home goods. It kind of depends on what the client wants, but I would say the stuff that I shop and that I'm most inspired by is in, in things the, you would wear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for, sure. for sure. Can we can we dive into that? Let's do it. Sure. Let me see the coat. So everybody, she designed and made the coat, correct? So this yeah. is a total bit of original. This is a Sasha original. You can't find it in stores. Can't find it. <laughs> Let's so, see. oh, there you can go. Um, I had, so I did a painting um, in my sketchbook, actually, that was based off of leaves, tropical leaves. And then I took it into Photoshop and turned it into a repeat, changed the colorways, and then created a whole. So this is why textile design is really cool, because otherwise it would just be a black coat. It's a super cool coat now. And I have the patch pockets Ooh. and the print is 100% my own. It's actually Sasha deconstructed and abstract. <laughs> Love it. I'm into it. I'm totally into it. <laughs> so you both are primary Photoshop. Is that, or do you guys dip between Photoshop and Illustrator? Primarily. Photoshop. <laughs> See, it's really funny. So um, I worked in New York City for a long time and I've worked in Los Angeles for a long time. And New York City prefers Photoshop, uh, Illustrator. Mm. When I go there and sell artwork, they all want Illustrator files, which is so funny to me because I grew up with the Photoshop world. And then here in LA, like nobody cares if it's Photoshop or Illustrator. So I always find it very interesting when it's like, oh, we do both or we're stronger because I'm terrible at Illustrator, but I can kill it. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. al it also probably varies on the market too. Oh, of course, of course. But it's yeah. funny because even like, I mean, paper market obviously will, because textile design is really, it's not even just about textiles, it's surface design. Mm -hmm. So anything like paper, prints, anything like that, it's kind of that world. So yeah, they prefer Illustrator, but so do kids wear and women's wear so it's it's really all over the place but you can do so much more in photoshop so much more so um what do you guys love most about textiles like what's the part that you're like that's that's why it's my future well i mean a lot of people that go into textiles it's like how sasha is how they're very artistic or they have like an art or ba art background and they kind of want to make it um, into a job that's more profitable and more useful in the industry. Um, that's what I think kind of is interesting about it. And it, it also, you're able to do so much with it. Like you said, it's surface design. It's not just fabrics. It's not just carpet. Right. It's like, it could be interiors. It could be fashion. It could be stationary. You have so many options. And it kind of teaches you computer skills and art skills. So you kind of have best of both worlds there too. Right, yeah. exactly. And like you, I did fashion design as well, and then textile. So you kind of like see the final result that it could be if you're going into fashion world, but also like, you know that design heavily weighs on the textile. Like exactly. without the clothes, you, you can't have it. So yeah. Well, that's why picked, yeah, that's why I picked textile design to major in anyways, because when I originally applied, I wanted to do in fashion design. Um, right. And then when I kind of looked into it, I kind of found that textiles was kind of the basis of the industry that a lot of people find inspiration from textiles. You have to consider everything from the prints and it's like all around us. So I thought when I was first applying after working with an advisor that that was the best route to kind of get the basis of the industry. And then I can build from there and grow as a stronger designer. hundred percent, hundred percent. Because I think, you know, and even, even I would um, work with a lot of designers and we would create custom prints 
and you would really have to like make their vision reality, but it would only be reality with the textile design. So it's really like a important, it's like the background people that kind of make everything beautiful, which is really great. So somebody's asking about the pieces behind you, Sophia. You care to dive in? Oh, behind me? Yes. Um, this is a quick drape that we did, um, but they're actually the prints that are going into the chair and styles category of the debut show this year. Um, it was from my collection that I did of Japanese inspired uh, calligraphy. Um, and then we got them printed. So the whole point of chairing styles is basically they use prints from the textile designer and a fashion designer and chair designer get to use it in a dress or a silhouette and then they get to use it in a chair for um, interiors. So this is some of the fabric that they're using. Um, I think Sasha has hers behind her as well. Ooh. Oh, that's cute. Super cute. Yeah, it's um, hand painted diamonds and eyes for the chairing styles that we did collaborate with the fashion and interiors. Too bad you guys didn't get a piece of the, the furniture, clothing, and <laughs> too bad, huh? They told me. <laughs> yeah. Do you actually, have you found that like doing calligraphy and signage like kind of trance? port into textiles because there's a lot of things that are like written I mean wrapping paper and things of that nature are too but like you can sneak it in things yeah you I mean something even something even like my jacket it's actually lettering and it's all words but it's done in a way that looks like a print um, so you can have it be very abstract and conceptual and deconstructed or you can have it be um, like a a um, what's it called, like a, it's conversational piece where it has like little illustrations and it has text and it has, you know, it could be food or it could be sports. Um, there's so many different ways that text comes into prints. Um, and you could also have it, it could be an all over print, like, like this jacket is an all over print or right. it could be featured on just as a, as a plate, as like a placement print where it's just on you know, coming out of the collar of a, of a jacket or of a, coming down on the dress or on the sleeve. I mean, it, you have so many different, so many different varieties and options. For sure. Um, so I have another question on the panelists. Um, they're saying, what is the best way to transfer it after? So in school, you do silk screening. But after, like, did you silk screen that jacket or did you spoon flower it? So this is, um, once I made the painting, I just scanned them. Scanning is the best way to have a high resolution uh, version of your image. And then you do it in Photoshop. Once it's a nice Photoshop file, you have it. I did this digitally printed and it's, um, yeah, I just, it was digitally printed, but you can do dyes, you have screen printing, you can do, um, there's embossing, there's embroidery, there's knitting. I mean, there's so many different applications <laughs> for design. Endless. Endless, yeah. Um, I would love to open it up to any of the panelists if they had any questions, and then we can dive into you guys' fun paintings and how, how we actually do that part. So, Let's see, does anybody have any wonderful questions? Sorry, guys. There. Oh, they want to know what material your jacket is. <laughs> um, this is made out of, it's actually like windbreaker material. It's very, very thin and light. Um, the color, it's a polyester, which is why the color is so vibrant. It's digitally printed. Right. Um, I mean, it looks exactly like the painting because it's on polyester. Um, if you do, depending on what type of fabric you use and what kind of dyeing technique, um, the colors either be more saturated or more muted. It just kind of depends. But yeah, this is digitally printed on a polyester. Interesting. So people are asking if you can create textiles at home. I have to say, like, I've 
I'm really bad at silk screening. I totally know that. Um, but I do know there is situations like Spoonflower and stuff, as long as you have the digital background to create your pattern and to the repeat. Because if you just send a pattern and repeat, and not in repeat, it's going to look terrible. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there's anybody so, else? Yeah, that's that's kind of the way you would do it if you wanted to order yardage and you didn't have like like a manufacturer or anything like that. If you're just ordering a couple yards, the easiest way to do it is through like a digital platform. Um, and that's that's basically how you do it. Um, from from and like they were saying before, the process behind making the textiles is what we're kind of going to show you next is basically we're gonna do the painting and then you scan it into the computer where you can manipulate it through Photoshop or Illustrator. And then once you, how you said with the repeats um, and figure out um, the sizing of everything. And then from there you can place orders or figure out another alternative like silk screening or anything like that. Another um, way you can do printing at home with very few materials is uh, block printing. And mm -hmm. it's a very, you can do repeats very quickly and very easily with a matter like just a few little tiles um, and you could use screen printing ink you could use uh, dyes um, there's a couple different websites that sell those dyes and you can order them online interesting okay ladies let's dive into the paintings and we'll still keep going through the questions as we we go along so let's see it and to the person that says they're not a good painter, I do have to say I'm not good at actual painting or art, um, but in Photoshop, once you learn how to control it and to, um, you know, kind of explore that side of things, definitely it's a great, I'm not great on paper, but I can sell a ton of artwork on Photoshop. So if you want to like go into textile design, it's definitely, um, and, yeah, yeah. And honestly, before I got to fit them, um, I knew how to draw, and I was a drawer, and I could, I could do that, and I could do other creative things. But I never actually painted prior to coming to fit them. Um, and then when I got into the program, they teach you from the beginning to the end. We use washes, we use dyes, we use different techniques. They teach you from from the basics to the advanced, from the beginning to the end of the program. So you don't really have to go into it knowing but as long as you're willing to learn they teach you everything you need to know really true very true and also it's one of those things where the more you practice the better you're going to get believe it or not i'm i was not a good painter <laughs> when i started and um i learned i took a painting class in high school and it was a very challenging and rude awakening of me realizing i didn't know how to paint um but as long as you just do a little bit every day, you can get those skills very quickly. Yeah, just have to practice and play with it, be open to experimentation and mark making and you'll, you'll eventually get it. Got it. Um, yeah, so let's look at those wonderful paintings we're doing. So because it's Earth Day, we are um, doing fish. And so we can see that. Okay, let's see. Sasha, let's see what your um, inspiration, how you got to here. Okay, so here, I'm just gonna put this out of the way. So because it's Earth Day, I wanted to focus on doing fish in the ocean and sea life. Um, there's a lot of variety of fish. I have a couple here and um, this is just the base this background is just uh playing with dyes and salt what's well, just watercolors and really loose brush strokes and then i have a couple little fish that i painted this is actually from my sketchbook i just photocopied these images and this is how we manually actually play with laying out a pattern so once you do your painting which we're gonna we're gonna um paint some fish. After you paint your fish, when you scan them in, you can move them around and, and play with uh, creating a repeat. Right now I have it in a mock-up of a half drop and um, you can move the fish around and kind of figure out 
you know, do I want to have it upside down? Do I want to have this backwards? Like, depending on how I want to lay it out. And this, this would be the basic and the beginning parts or like the beginning stages of creating a repeat that then I could have printed onto fabric. So it's just figuring out your layout, just showing the process so you guys can understand, you know, how you come from a painting in a sketchbook and how to create it into an image. You just play around with creating a repeat with that. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's a great way of showing how you would actually work with it on the computer because you have your background and then you can take your motifs and kind of move them as you wish. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun. Yeah. Uh, so Sophia, where's, let's see where you're at. Are we going to dive into some dyes? I see some yeah. pipettes. So um, when we, anytime we try to start creating anything, we kind of try to get as much reference as possible. So, so both Sasha and I have pictures of fish that we're going to paint today. Um, what we're doing instead of using color watercolors or dyes, we're gonna use um, watercolored pencils. Um, they're basically colored pencils that are wa water soluble. And what that means is that when you put water over it, it will bleed, which will cause it to make paint. Um, it's a less messier version of doing watercolor, but it acts the same. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today and making some fish. Oh, fun. Let's start. Um, so you guys are both in the program. I graduated quite a while ago, but do you guys ever use jacquard looms or anything like that in the program? Yeah, we, um, in the program, we're able to use a lot of different techniques, not just painting. Um, we go into it learning how to weave on the loom. We learn how to knit on the stole machines. So we get a lot of experience with different mediums to cover all of textiles in general um, and get a better understanding of how many applications textiles can go on. Interesting, yeah, because it's a whole world. Yeah, for sure. There is so many things that we can do with textiles that you might not even consider if you don't um, truly like understand what textiles is. For sure. And then do you guys always stick to the watercolor pencils or do you sometimes just dive into regular? Do you find it more helpful to kind of sketch it out since you're doing like more motif work? Um, I usually just use a graphite and then go in with watercolors. Uh, the beauty of these pencils is that when you lay it down, it actually blends in with the watercolors if you're using watercolors or even if you're using gouache, it blends in with what you're doing and you don't have a pencil mark. Sometimes the pencil mark actually can be used to your advantage as a design element. Um, and I usually like to do that. So I'll do it in graphite, but if you don't wanna have the pencil lines, these types of pencils are perfect. Interesting. So let's let's see what fishes are we starting with. So we're gonna do the clownfish. This this cute fish right here. Um, our little Nemo. fine Nemo. Our little Nemo. <laughs> yeah. So um, for the watercolor pencils, if you have drawing experience, this will be a great transition to painting. If you don't have drawing experience, that's totally fine. You can work on just being comfortable with like mark making, how getting familiar with like how this material is. Um, every paint and drawing material is going to be a little bit different. So it's just practicing and playing with it, not getting not getting um, too caught up in making it look realistic. It having it feel like what you want it to feel like and resemble that. It doesn't have to be realistic. It can also just be you know, a blob of color with some really interesting mark making. Um, so don't get too caught up if it's not looking like exactly like a picture. I want to show just these right here real quick. Um, with watercolor pencils, 
there's a couple different styles that you can use to have different mark making and blending. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm probably just gonna show like a couple of them. Um, but if you go online, you can watch videos of all the different ways that you can use these materials, so. And right. as Sasha was talking, I'm gonna start making a fish and she's gonna explain some techniques to use and then go ahead do, to do her fish as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So first, I'm just going to start with drawing like a little oval. Doesn't have to be perfect. And this has like a little, this fish almost has a mohawk. <laughs> and here's this little tail. So if you don't have, this is just really rough. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just kind of getting the the feel of it and just play the pencils really are forgiving once you get in there like yeah. this is a good time to like be loose and be rough and then you can you know get in deeper later exactly exactly and the nice thing about this is yeah once the, you add the water your all your marks um they actually fade so the technique i'm starting with that we're both starting with is where you do the dry pencil on the paper and um, when you add the water, the color is going to be a little bit less saturated than if you were to do it this other way that I'm going to show you after. Um, so one of the one of the reasons why this is really good to do before your or to map out your repeat or your painting and say you're going to do it in, in dyes or in actual watercolor. The reason why this is pretty desirable for most people is you can make your lines completely disappear. So I have a, just a basic, just a really basic sketch. Um, if I wanna fill it in, tilting your pencil on the side is a really good way to get more of that pigment on the paper. Um, if you do it straight up, you're just gonna have just the point of the pencil touch. And since pencil, these pencils are pretty small, it's harder to get like more fluid motion and also get, have a better cover on the paper. So I'm just gonna, have it on the side, fill it in like that. Do you guys have a specific brand that you guys enjoy for pencils? Because I know, I know that they're not all created equal. I don't have a specific brand for watercolor pencils. Um, for just regular color pencils, I really, really love. Oh, just like, oh yeah. See, she has Derwent. The ones I have are, I think I have Stodler. Yeah, Stodler. They make a lot There's of- There's a good variety of both. Um, yeah. you, can, you can choose different ones and test them out. Um, I personally like these ones because they're more pigmented, um, but it just depends on what look you're going for. Um, but you can choose different kinds and try them out because there's a lot of different variations of them. Awesome. Always good to know. So it can be overwhelming. Yeah, there's so many different kinds. Um, so I just did like a very basic filling in. It's not all the way filled in. It's not solid. You can see the grain of the, of the paper through the marks, which is totally fine. You don't have to blend it in perfect. Um, and I'll, I, using a, it's actually like a water, water brush so all it has is just some water you fill it up with water it comes through the top right here and you can either squeeze this and have the water come out Let's squeeze this and see if you drop on the paper or what i do is i just have a cup of water um and then you can just let's see once you add the water the the pencils very quickly, the marks start to start to dissolve. You can fill it in kind of however you like. The more pencil you lay down, the darker it's gonna be. However, this, even if you lay it down pretty thick, it will not be as pigmented as, this is another way you can do it. I wanna add some yellow into this Nemo. 
if I take the uh, brush and I, it's wet and I put it directly on the pencil, I'll actually be able to get a huge amount of pigment directly off there and it's gonna be darker. It's also not gonna show any of the lines of the pencil on there. So if you want it to have a watercolor feel, this is a really good way to lay down flat color without it showing any of the marks of the pencil. Underneath. That's really great because it, it's definitely keeping like the watercolor, you know, how it has the highs and lows naturally in it. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. So just filling this in. And you'll see we each have different techniques on how we're, how we're filling in it. <laughs> so as you get more comfortable with it, you're going to find a way that works for you. And every time you do it, you might not even do it the same every time. It's always good to kind of try it out a different way each time too, so. Yeah, that's the great part about painting is you can kind of just go with it. You're not totally married to it. Exactly. Yeah, because Sophia's is a lot more brighter, but that's because she filled it in quite a bit more. Yeah. Very nice. So and what I did um, for mine, I layered some different types of colors on it um, to make it brighter. So I added yellow where the highlights would be at the top of the fish. Um, and then I added darker colors like reds um, underneath so that it can create shadows. So you can play with the color in that sense too, to have the shadowing of everything. Interesting. But but that's also a style preference as well. Um, you kind of get get the hang of what you like to do more than other things. And then from there, you kind of determine what how you want to paint things in certain ways. Interesting. And so what are you guys, like, while you're painting, <laughs> I'm going to continue to ask you questions. Um, mm -hmm. What is your dream career with your textile design degree? Is it like studio life or would you like to go more towards like, you know, working for a company? Um, well, like I said earlier, my original intention going into textiles was to get a better understanding of design. Um, and it's more of a knowledge basis. Um, but when I went into it, it kind of, I kind of fell in love with it. It was something that I thought that was an easy way to customize things, an easy way to personalize um, garments or stationery or anything really. And so when I start going more into the industry, I kind of want to work for a company, I would say, um, especially at, at first and kind of, again, I'm a learner at heart and I just want to gain as much knowledge as possible. <laughs> so I would love the experience to work um, in different types of offices and different types of workplaces where they'll teach me a different skill set every time because knowledge is <laughs> power, you know? <laughs> agreed, agreed. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's so many paths you can go down in it. Like I got to travel the world with just selling artwork and that's where I learned a majority of it you know what I mean like there's so many different ways you can have fun with textiles and that's a that's also a dream I've always had is traveling around um so that's awesome that you have that opportunity to be able to do that yes pre-covid I would go to New York City every three months from Los Angeles um and then and then do trade shows in between there so oh wow it was I always got to travel which was a really great um great thing when I was really young I think one yeah. of the best things about traveling and one of the reasons I actually love traveling um one of the reasons I like to travel is to actually go see different textiles around the world and draw my inspiration from that um, so that were huge, yeah, if I could travel the world and create prints kind of a, from everywhere, mix them together and kind of create my own mix of cultures and 
places and colors and designs. For sure. There's a lot of places to get some great inspiration from. Yeah. Um, so another thing you can do with the pencils is you can actually dip them directly in the water. And when you dip it, when you dip the pencil in the water, it's gonna it's gonna make it darker. So like right here, the reason that's so dark is because I dipped the pencil in the water. It makes the pigment really um, moist and you can lay down so much more of it. Oh, that's really great. And then well, you can even take your, your water over it again. Yeah, and then I can take the brush and go over it again. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's really fun. Did you guys make collections of fish in, in school recently? No. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell Anne to get on that fish collection. We did do a fish collection in my program, I think, once um, in one of my computer programs, actually. We were um, doing a men's market, and we had to target our um, textiles towards a men's um, shirt, our dad's shirt, basically. Um, and that was kind of the direction they were giving us. Um, so we made variations of fish and was able to do that at one point in the program. <laughs> Interesting. So we have a question on here. What has been the best resource for you guys learning about textile designs? Um, I mean, resources in the sense of like inspiration, um, I think, well, for a lot of our classes, what they made us do um, was go into the market and like go to stores and look online and kind of see what is what is relevant and what is going on in the world today. And that kind of tailored towards a lot of resources that we used in school as well is like looking into the real world and kind of seeing how the industry really alters what we're designing. Um, and I think that was that was a consistent thing that we learned here because it's so important to know what's current and what's going on in the world um, and tailor it towards how we can market it in our industry. For sure. That's how I always do it too. I feel like I'm always on Pinterest, but I'm just trying to look for what's next, what's new, what's good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Pinterest is always good to look at too. Um, you get an idea of what other people are making and get ideas from different types of theme boards. Um, a lot of the time when you're making concept boards for different collections, you pull resources um, from anywhere. And Pinterest is one of those things where as long as you find something that kind of speaks to you, you can kind of use that as a resource to reference um, some ideas and kind of open your mind to different possibilities. Yeah, agreed. And there's a lot of great color palettes that I feel like in the textile world, like color is just such a huge part of it. And so you can really like dive in and, you know, explore color digitally like that. Yeah. Well, for a long time, that's another job that you can go into as well as a career is being a colorist and working with color all the time um, and being, a, being able to create and compose color palettes and themes is one thing that like we work on all the time because in everyday life, everything is a color palette. If it's not aesthetically pleasing, no one's going to buy it. <laughs> totally, totally. I have some prints that like they'll be four years old and I'll recolor them and they'll sell instantly. It's just a color thing. Yeah, for sure. It's all perception. Yeah, for sure. And it, it makes it look new. Exactly. Uh, um, so do you guys carry your inspiration notebooks around with you and you just kind of like dive in when you get inspired or how do you use your inspiration notebook because I know you guys like sketch down a lot of motifs prior or explore things. I have my phone on me at all times and I take pictures of things all the time when I'm out and about. Um, whether it's cracks in the sidewalk or it's the leaves on the ground or it could be I mean it could be it could be anything it could be like a plant maybe a bucket of paint spilled in the street. I'll take a picture of that and then I'll 
print it out, put it in my sketchbook and use that as a reference to then create a print. Interesting. One thing that we did in the program that I thought was really neat is that um, we did exactly that, is that we went on a little field walking field trip through downtown LA where we're located. Um, and we were able to kind of pull resources from different um, textiles or different resources around our city. Um, plants, uh, buildings, different types of carpets and hotels, different types of architecture. There's just an abundance of things that you're able to kind of pull from. Um, so that was a fun exercise that we were able to kind of expose to. And I think Sasha and I both do it where we are able to use those kind of ideas uh, to find inspiration all the time. For sure. Do you guys have your notebooks now? Are we allowed to take a sneak peek? Yeah. Let's check those bad boys out. Oh, I like that what you're doing with the, the razor. Oh. So another, this is one of the other techniques. I was just gonna, I can go over it really quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll just explain it. So once you have water on the on the paper, I'll do it over here. So there's a you can see where it's kind of wet on the paper. Once you have water on the paper, and it's nice. It kind of looks like a cooling up a little bit on the paper and it's reflecting. You can take be any color you want. You take a either pencil sharpener or a razor or something that has a hard edge, hard edge. You could use scissors and you just shave little bits off of it. You can those little sprinkles, they'll bleed into the water and they'll create little speckles. And it's a really good way to add texture without having to hand mark and sketch every little dot or every little um, every little thing. Like it's great for, yeah. it's oh, really great. for mark making and texture. So it's, you know, if your if your rendering isn't as isn't as um, strong because you're new to drawing, there's so many other ways that you can create very interesting um, and very realistic paintings without having to shade everything perfectly. Um, for example, some of the, there's like a texture in the fish right here. I just made this the same, but just shaving some of the little pieces of the pigment on this area. And it gives it that feel without actually having to hand draw all of that. And it also makes it much faster. It's a little short. And it looks very organic, which I personally love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so let's see um, place. The, yeah, sure so no. notebooks are kind of subjective on how you want to use them um in our classes throughout both programs that i have been through we had notebooks for every single class i keep everything so i have a notebook for every single class from every single quarter i've done um this was a notebook that i had in the ba program um the way that Sasha does her notebooks are a little different from how I do my notebooks. I'm very scrappy, so I take a lot of bigger pieces of paper and I paint a bunch of things, cut them out, paste them in my book. Rather than um, doing it all in one book, I'm all over the place and then later on compile it. So here's um, from my Japanese inspired calligraphy collection. Um, this was kind of how I started everything. Um, and we go off of kind of theme boards that we do. So we compile a bunch of references and different types of pictures that we can use from different resources. A lot of these came from Pinterest. Um, some were from museums that um, were given, had royalty free pictures that we can use to reference. Um, so it was all something that we had to compile before even starting the, pro the project. Um, and this collection actually was based off a knitwear collection that I did the quarter prior. And this was my digital prints that I did. Um, oh, really so cool. I'll go through it more. real quick. To more. Kind of go through. And you get kind of the idea of how 
you paint a bunch of things and how that's how I start is basically getting as many ideas as possible on little sheets of paper and then going from there and being able either to scan them in or paint them bigger once you get the kind of general idea of a collection or variation of textures that you kind of want to create. And this is a great thing that people could do at home too because you can totally dive into like a, a feeling with paint or drawing or whatever. I know exactly. I, was, I was a high schooler with lots of um, notebooks and things of that nature. Yeah, and, and uh, like I said, Sasha does more of a artistic fine arts background. So she has a very, very artistic scrapbook type of looking notebook. And I think she brought it today. So I want her to show it because there is differences between hers and mine, where mine is very much um, just pasted together artworks that I've done in the past, where she has kind of like sketches here and there, notes on it. And it's kind of all over the place, which is kind of neat as well, because you can get inspiration from that just alone. Right. Oh, very cool. And we tried to compile more than one reference so that we don't, like she said earlier, not to copy anything and make sure it's truly ours. So we kind of play around with different type of combinations of reference. For sure. There is laws against copying. Yeah. And then you can get in trouble and you don't want that. Nobody likes that. Yeah. actually my house plant <laughs> and some broken glass <laughs> on the street and then I created a pattern just from my little plant. Oh that's so cute. That's really neat. Do you guys do any other type of paintings or just watercolor? I know in the I mean, it's your own choice, but just you guys personally. Um, um, yeah, I, I paint with everything. I actually did in college at CalArts, I did um, portraiture and oils. And I also used to do murals in uh, Nova Color, which is like a water-based acrylic ink. Um, and then at work, we use spray paint, paint pens, acrylic, we use every chalkboard paint. Um, a little bit of everything. So. Interesting. And like I said before, I was not a painter prior to going into the program. Um, so my basis is all watercolor dyes and gouache. Um, and so I use those most consistently. Um, I recently started trying new things um, and trying new mediums, but my go-to is always watercolor dyes and going into that. Very cool. So I actually saw this walking to campus. Uh, it's one of the classes, I think it was Studio One or City Tech One. And um, I, I just love the way that this door, it's like the door that goes into the Metro where the, like the air comes out of it. And I love the way this looks. And I was like, I really would like to just play around with a print that I could make based off of this picture. So I just took it on my, took a picture on my phone. And then later I was like, oh, I have, some, I have a really good image to use in my sketchbook. Let me just go find that picture. So me and Sasha both went to different schools prior to FITM. But Sophia, you went to straight FITM, right? Yeah, yeah, I went straight, straight from high school. Through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been in FITM. I've been at FITM for about four years now, or technically five years, um, but five school years, basically. <laughs> Interesting. So um, somebody's asking about what companies hire textile designers. There is so many different types of companies that hire that because 
it's really like we said, it's it's um, surface design. So notebook companies hire um, fashion in any fashion. So swimwear, women's wear, men's, kids. There's a ton. I if you go onto any like monster or whatever, look for textile companies or textile design jobs. There's a ton. Right now, it's especially good because you can really do it at home. Like I was working at home prior to that. So that's a really great um, way to do it. So yeah. So for tips for fashion students that want to find a good manufacturer in printing design, that's super hard because Personally, what I've, what I've found is a lot of people, I mean, it's like big companies that use those, but there's a lot of local ones. I don't know if they're open right now because of COVID, but um, you can definitely find digital ones. It just might be a higher price point to print yardage for sure. Is that same for you guys? Yeah, that's kind of the idea that I've come across too is that because other friends of mine in the fashion design program have, a, have asked me about manufacturers, but it's it, you have to have a certain amount of yardage when ordering. Um, so it's you have to have a bigger order basically to go through a lot of the manufacturers that are local. Yeah, for sure. Um, for my business, I we have a question about that. Um, I started by selling artwork for another company. So that really gave me like, the knowledge to jump off and do my own. So I always think that school and then experience is definitely your best way of going into an industry. Um, and then I was really lucky because once you're working for somebody, you really start to learn other people and the clients and what they want and what works and what doesn't. So you're kind of learning while somebody else is paying for you. So that's really um, a great way to go. Um, and in studio, like when there, there's a textile design studio, we really create something for everyone. So we might have a slightly bigger catering towards um, children's wear or like young and fun things. However, we have prints for absolutely everyone. So we have artists that like represent everyone. So um, it's really great. And you can really sell to everybody from target to Bloomingdale's it's it's all over the place so that's a really fun aspect to work with it's really you get like to work on the fun side of things instead of the measuring it's what I found because I also did tech, uh, fashion design so I did not like the measuring how about you Sophia do you like yeah. the measuring I mean, I'm fairly new to the whole fashion industry and working in, with making garments, but um, yeah, the technical portion is a lot different from textile design. Textile design, you have a little more leeway into how creative you can be. Um, uh, there's a little bit, I feel from my background, there's a little bit more limitation of how creative I can go just because you only know so many techniques until you learn them um, and then go in from there but there is a lot of math that goes into it. Yeah. This very, is, very true. I found the sketchbook page that this is actually one of my just experimental doodles I did um, based on leaves. And I, this is the print that I use for the jacket that I'm wearing. I just changed the colors. So this is the actual painting. And then I scanned it in, edited it and changed the colors. So I just wanted to show you guys this is, this is where I started and then it ended up as my jacket. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I don't even know how it's already six because I feel like there's so much more we could go over because textiles are fun. Um, but I wanted to thank both of you girls for coming on and showing all of your amazing artwork and painting some really cool fish with us. Um, we have some really great other FITM events, so make sure you keep up on all of that. And for more website, uh, just go to FITM's website and you can catch up on all of the events and to learn more. <laughs>